it's muskan jindal i welcome you all here on the behalf of iit today we are here to learn about rbc tsai and opportunities for bsc data science and programming students from professor bala raman ravindran himself b ram ravindran heads the robert bosch center for data science and artificial intelligence at iit madras one of the leading interdisciplinary ai, AI research centers in india He is the Mindtree Faculty Fellow and Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Madras. He has held visiting positions at the Indian Institute of Science, University of Technology, Sydney, and Google Research. Currently, his research interests span the area of geometric deep learning and reinforcement learning. He has published over hundred papers in premier journals and conferences. His work with students has won multiple best paper awards the most recent being the best application paper at PAK DD 2021 he received his phd from the university of massachusetts amherst and his masters degree from the indian institute of science bangalore he is a senior member of the association for advancement of ai and an acm distinguished member Now, sir, we would like to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you, Ms. Khan, for that uh, kind introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm just going to start sharing my presentation. Uh, I hope uh, people can see it. Uh, Ms. Khan, can you confirm whether you can see my presentation? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. Check. I'm just minimizing all the <laughs> pop-up windows on my screen before I start. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and uh, so um, thank you for uh, you know uh, coming here to to hear about uh, what we do at the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI at IIT Madras. So uh, to start off, right? Um, so the the Bosch Center, or rather this whole uh, uh, initiative on uh, interdisciplinary data science research at IIT Madras, uh, started back in uh, okay, started back in 2014 uh, as the interdisciplinary lab for data science, uh, where a group of faculty who are interested in working on Uh, something called network science. I'll I'll elaborate on it as we go along, and uh, we kind of got together and started this group back in 2014. 13 faculty across six departments. So even back then, it was a very strongly interdisciplinary center, right? Uh, but then, 2017, uh, it became the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI with support from uh, um, uh, Robert Bosch uh, uh, India, right? And uh, now. Uh, it spans 12 different departments at IIT Madras, uh, including uh, departments such as uh, biosciences and humanities and management science, and has 32 faculty members who are associated with the center uh, in some form or the other. And over the last uh, four years uh, or so, we have produced nearly 140 papers, and uh, now uh, we fund from the center about 32 different projects. Which are strongly interdisciplinary, right? So it's not just uh, from uh, uh, computer science uh, or any one sub-discipline, but cutting across uh, multiple disciplines. So that's one of the core things, you know. I want you to you know, grasp from this talk is that data science, right? I know that uh, many of you are, are part of this online uh, data science program, right? Uh, but data science is not something that is uh, that's just a set of mathematical tools. Something that you have to really work. with people from a particular domain right so that's essentially why you see me uh, reiterate uh, so much the interdisciplinarity of the center right uh, so um in looking into uh, more numbers like i already said we have 32 faculty uh, 12 different departments and uh, we have 80 plus researchers currently uh, a good fraction of whom are phd scholars uh, but we also have multiple opportunities for people to come be associated as uh, research fellows as interns and as visiting researchers and so on and so forth right and uh, there are quite a bit of these opportunity that i'll also highlight uh, uh, towards the end of my talk right and i said we have like 140 publications and about uh, um, uh, half of those right That's about 63 of these are in very high impact uh, venues right so and uh, so and more more importantly these numbers are uh, are without context for most of you right so i'm going to talk about 
uh, some of our research areas, the areas that uh, uh, RBC DSI works in, right, a uh, very high high level, right, and also talk about some of the application areas that uh, we work in, right. So you can see that I put on four uh, top level areas that we work in: deep learning, network science, uh, reinforcement learning, and fairer interpretable machine learning. So I'll try to give you a sense of uh, each of these as we go along, right. So let's start off with deep learning, right. So whenever we say uh, machine a machine is learning, right? So at the at the core of it, it's a it's a very simple task that we are trying to perform, right? So the machine is trying to learn uh, uh, functions, right, uh, from the input to output, right? So it gives give, given some kind of an input, it's supposed to produce an output, but it's not told what the form of the function is, right? If I tell you, you know, y equals sine x, right? Then give me if I give you an x, you can tell me what y is. Right? But instead of that, I'm going to give it to you in the form of uh, these kinds of examples. Right? So in this particular instance, um, so I'm saying that, okay, if, if you give me this as the input, right, then I want you to tell me it is an airplane. Right? If you give me this as an input, I want you to tell me it is a bird and so on and so forth. So I give you a lot of these examples right? and then I'm expecting you to learn a mapping, right? So there are many ways in which people have been trying to address these problems, right? Especially uh, this kind of uh, uh, working with image and trying to identify uh, what's that in the image, right? This kind of image classification problem has proved to be very hard uh, to tackle for uh, machines uh, historically, right? So, but people have been trying to work on this problem from at least the 50s, right? So, so what happened was that. Uh, um, So what happened was that uh, uh, about uh, 10 years back, right? So people started exploring uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know, connected uh, computing units, right? Which are called uh, neurons, right? So they're basically looking at this kind of really uh, many, many layered uh, computing units, right? So and then uh, they built, built, built together complex uh, architectures such as this convolutional neural network that I put in here. And these essentially operate by, uh, 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 by extracting uh, more and more uh, Apologies, uh, so there seems to be some problem in getting the slides to change. Right. So by, by, you know, for each of these layers, you remember I was showing you these uh, layers here, right? And uh, each of these layers, uh, sorry. So each of these layers, right, uh, start computing progressively uh, more and more, uh, 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 you know, uh, complex features that describe the image. So, for example, the first layer just looks at patches of color and, and the edges and so on and so forth. And then subsequent layers start looking at, you know, smaller, uh, more and more uh, complex patterns, right? And then, uh, and then you can see that uh, higher layers start, you know, getting parts of objects, uh, Uh, so it starts, starts annotating parts of the object and then finally at the end, right, we're able to put everything together and then start learning uh, functions as to how to label these, right? And, um, is somebody else having control of my slides? Yeah, see, now it went back one more. I didn't, I, I just pressed only one back. So, and then I'm not able to control it with my keyboard. I have to use them when I have to click there. Just, just I don't know what's happening, but anyway, fine. Let's finish the talk. Let's, I, I, I like to sum up. Right? So, this kind of deep learning architectures, right, allowed people to allowed people to solve uh, you know non-trivial problems. I didn't click on it. And was not allows people to solve really non-trivial problems, especially this kind of uh, image classification problem, right? Uh, and so uh, back in 2010, uh, people were uh, having uh, almost 30% uh, error, right, on this task, right? And then uh, when deep learning started kicking in, which is about uh, the year 2014, uh, you can see, uh, 2012, you can see there's a huge drop uh, in, in, uh, in, in the error rate, right? So from making around 25% error, it came down to around 15%. And eventually, deep learning architectures started making fewer errors than a human does 
on identifying objects in a debate. Right? So that kind of kickstarted this whole hoopla. And nowadays, people do a lot of research uh, with, with these kinds of deep architectures, right? whether it be processing images, whether it be processing text, audio, you know, uh, other kinds of structured and unstructured data. Uh, people have started looking at uh, uh, deep neural networks in a, uh, in a, in a very, very uh, deep way. Right, and uh, so no AI lab in the world can say that they are doing cutting edge research in AI unless they are looking at deep learning. Right, so and, uh, likewise in uh, in RPC side, we do a lot of work in deep learning um, and related uh, to that computer vision, NLP, and some of the uh, interesting uh, contributions that we have made are, uh, you know, building a Indian language suit uh, that my colleague uh, uh, Dr. Mitesh Kapra has done. And uh, so we're doing significant amount of work uh, in this space and uh, not just in, you know, doing just research papers, but, you know, getting out products to the field and working with startups and various companies in order to build solutions based on this uh, kind of deep learning setting. Right? And the next area that I want to talk about is network science. Okay, so what do we mean by networks? So networks are nothing but, you know, you can think of them as graphs, right? So graphs that, you know, uh, represent relationships. So if you look at a lot of sources of data in the world, right? So they come in the form of graphs, right? Uh, whether it is, you know, like social networks where each node in the graph is a user and, you know, friendships or, uh, you know, follower relationships form the edges in the in the graph, or it could be like, uh, uh, you know, a transportation network. So that's, that's a snapshot of the Indian railway network where each node is a station and the link between uh, two nodes means that there is a track or there's a train running between those stations. Right? And like that, you could look at technological networks, information networks, right, and collaboration networks, who works with who in the offline setting also. And more uh, importantly, in a lot of biological contexts, right, uh, uh, networks arise, whether it is talking about gene-gene interaction or whether you're talking about the structure of a molecule uh, that's uh, biologically active and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so people uh, model it in terms of uh, these kinds of graphs and networks, right? And um, and these these networks can not just uh, you know model one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction. I was telling you that uh, you know if two, there are two friends, then there's a connection between them. Uh, it could also be like uh, like a classroom setting, right? So where there are all the students who are taking a single class, right? all every one of you who's doing uh, linear algebra, right? All of you have some kind of relationship among yourselves, right? So these kinds of higher order relationships also uh, can be captured by uh, special forms of graphs. So in RBC design, we study these uh, uh, graphs and in, in the various contexts that they appear in, right? Not just in the context of uh, 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 these like, like graphs in computer algorithms, but looking at it in the context of biology, in the context of transportation, in the context of other kinds of uh, uh, interaction uh, thing, right? So, So we are primarily focused on uh, using uh, you know, what are called graph embedding techniques, right? where you take a network. You remember I was telling you that uh, we learned a lot of features from, uh, so we learned a lot of features from, uh, Trying to follow other Bluetooth devices to see if this weird behavior will stop. But anyway, uh, so I was telling you that how uh, deep deep networks learn features from images, right, and then use it for uh, uh, you know uh, identifying what is there in the picture, right. So like that, you can also take networks and learn features from the networks, right, and see how we can use that for uh, you know things like identifying uh, uh, who, I mean, what role does a person play or what subject a person likes and so on and so forth. All kinds of questions that you can ask uh, on, on, on this network, right? So that's something there. And uh, there are many, many applications that span social networks, collaboration networks, biological networks, language, right? And uh, co-purchase, what are called co-purchase networks, like things on Amazon. So what are things, who bought what together, and then you can analyze that and so on and so forth, right? So this kind of network appears all over the place. And that's just giving you an example. And again, uh, we do a lot of work in this uh, space of networks, and you can see that the list of faculty would probably be the, uh, the largest in this, and also uh, they cover multiple departments, CS, biotech, chemical engineering, and so on and so forth, electrical engineering, et cetera.
And the next area that we work on, and something that I have spent a lot of time doing, uh, is something called uh, 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 reinforcement learning. So I was telling you, I started off by telling you that deep learning works with uh, large volumes of data, right? And uh, and um, you know that all this uh, somebody comes and tells you, uh, okay, if this is the input, this is the output you have to produce, right? And then um, and then you learn a function, right? Instead of somebody telling you, yeah, y equals sine x. Somebody says, okay, if this is the x, this is the y, you have to figure out what, what is the f that takes from x to y. Right? So I told you this is usually what uh, uh, you know, machine learning does and deep learning solves that. And you can also answer these questions on uh, graphs or networks, right? But then if you think of how you learn to cycle, right? That was never done from this kind of data alone, right? And you can, I can give you hours of uh, YouTube video to watch. Uh, you're not going to be able to cycle just by watching those videos. You have to try things, right? It has to be trial and error. And so you get some feedback, right? Falling down hurts, or there is an adult with you who is going to clap and say, yeah, well done, beta, or something like that. So that's basically the feedback you're going to get, right? So uh, so that is the uh, uh, only source of feedback you get to learn, right? So in some sense, if you look at uh, the, the image uh, you know, labeling problem that we spoke about, somebody tells you, okay, if this is the X, this is the Y. So if I give you as this, this as X, you have to produce that as Y, right? So, I'm giving you this kind of uh, instructions. If this is the input, then you have to give me that output. That instruction is given to you, right? But here, in reinforcement, in, in this kind of learning to cycle, uh, you get only evaluation. So first, you, I present you with the situation. You have to do something. Right? And then you get evaluated for what you did, right? So this, the mathematical abstraction, right, for, of this kind of a trial and error learning is what is reinforcement learning. So a lot of situations in which reinforcement learning uh, problems appear, right? And then uh, people have looked at it uh, extensively. In fact, I started off with this example of cycling because many of you might still remember how you learn to cycle, right? Uh, most of you remember how you learn to cycle. But then this is how babies learn to walk, right? This is how babies learn to talk, etc. It's trial and error, right? Nobody actually tells a baby how to form your vocal cord to produce a particular word. The baby just babbles. And whenever the baby says something that sounds like mama, mama, or something like that, people just go crazy, and then it gets all the feedback it wants. And eventually, you know, the the the, the reward that it gets is that it manages to communicate its need uh, using language, and therefore it learns to verbalize things. Right. So that's how it learns to talk. That's how that's how the babies learn to walk as well. Right. So it's a, it's a very fundamental mode by which uh, animals and humans learn. Right? Uh, And uh, it appears in a variety of situations. And a lot of success stories of reinforcement learning is there. So in the olden uh, avatar of reinforcement learning back in like the 90s and uh, uh, 2000, so you had things like right, uh, reinforcement learning that learns to fly a helicopter or reinforcement learning used to control robots, right? or reinforcement learning used in advertising, computational advertising, or, or, or in selecting uh, uh, stories and things for you. A lot of success, success in game, modern game playing, right? Uh, reinforcement learning has a lot of success in modern game playing. But more importantly, uh, RL also has this recent uh, uh, success in uh, uh, solving very complex problems such as protein folding. Right? It's very hard to figure out what the structure of a protein is because then only then you know what would be the functionality of a protein. Right? And it turns out to be a non-trivial problem. And other other situations like power control and uh, try using um, uh, um, yeah, so so using uh, reinforcement learning to actually manage the uh, power consumption in the data center, right? So that uh, minimize, uh, reduce power consumption by like forty percent. So a lot of situations where you don't know what is the right answer to do, you know what is the right thing to do, but you can recognize the answer when it happens, right? In such situations, uh, reinforcement learning plays a big role, right? And again, uh, we have uh, one of the largest uh, reinforcement learning groups uh, in, in in the country. Uh, in uh, in uh, RBC design and we work extensively with the industry on various uh, application of RL problems and also we work uh, on uh, you know, building the fundamental RL theory not just on the applications so so far I've been talking about all the success stories and everything right so but so typically you know when uh, all this modern AI works we are all very happy right? Uh, but then uh, sometimes AI does uh, crazy stuff like that. Right? Uh, so you can see this, right? So here it was all nice, right? A person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road, great, right? It's, it's, it's labeling things correctly. 
Uh, but sometimes uh, things like this happen, right? And so now it says a skateboarder does a trick on a ramp, but some, obviously somebody riding a cycle. And it says a little girl in a pink hat is blowing bubbles, right? So I don't know what happened. So in such cases, I really would like to know why it did that, right? And even in cases where it doesn't do crazy things like this, right? Uh, I would like to know uh, why 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 the AI made a certain decision, right? So for example, uh, in things like uh, you know lending, right, or, or, or trying to figure out uh, some somebody should get a loan or not. If AI is saying you shouldn't get a loan, I would like to know why it said that. Right? So it's crucial being able to explain or even at least being able to interpret what is the answer that the AI gave in such situations. And people actually do things like this, right? Okay, here is the original image, and now I tell you there is a dog in the image. Why did you tell me it is a dog, right? And then the AI says, okay, these pixels made me say it's a dog, right? That's basically it. And then how you interpret that uh, to understand whether the AI is doing something good or wrong uh, is, is still an open question. And this, so the images, it is fine. But now if I start talking about loan decisions, it's becoming more tricky. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in order to make the AI ready uh, to go out, uh, you know, uh, uh, to to face a human who is going to be affected by the decisions of the AI, right? And that shows up in a variety of different settings. So here is an example of from uh, the, the bail decision program that I was telling you about, right? So it, it looked at two people and said that the guy on the left uh, is a low risk offender and the, and the girl on the right is a high risk offender, right? So don't give her bail because she's likely to do, commit a crime. Well, the guy on the left is not, right? But then you go and look at what these, what these people have done, right? So the guy on the left had two armed robberies, attempted armed robbery, and after they left him free, he went and you know robbed, uh, you know, so was involved in a grand theft, right? While the girl on the right was like had four juvenile misdemeanors, very minor that we have not even recorded, and after she was released, she committed no further offense, even though the AI thought she was at high risk, right? So this notion of you know fairness again comes into play here. Right? So. And so obviously the AI is not going to be explained why it did this. If it's going to give an explanation, it's probably going to say the person on the right was African American, therefore was at high risk, right? But then this whole idea of uh, you know uh, AI's decision being fair, right, uh, uh, is, is 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 still uh, a moot question. Right? It's a lot of work that is happening in that space, right? And uh, so here is another example. So Amazon scraps a secret AI recruiting tool that showed bias against women. So that's again another. Uh, important challenge that we have to address because women were underrepresented. So it didn't learn how to uh, process women applicants properly. Right? So this raises serious ethical questions, right? So you know, AI sending people to jail and getting it wrong, right? And AI thinking everybody is white because it takes a picture of Obama and converts that to a white person, right? And all these kinds of uh, issues arise. So so uh, uh, fairness, uh, you know, ethical, ethics and interpretability has become a big area of research in AI. And obviously, uh, obviously AI also uh, does a lot of work in this. And in fact, we are looking at uh, questions that are uh, very specific uh, for AI and ethics in the Indian context. So that's that's another uh, area that I'm looking at. So I, I basically outlined four major areas that we work in deep learning, uh, network analytics or network science, uh, 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 reinforcement learning, and as well as fairness, ethics, and interpretability of AI. So these are uh, uh, more research areas. You can come to our web page and know more about the kind of papers that we publish and uh, the projects that are being run in this space, right? Then we work on multiple uh, applied uh, problems as well. Right? So we work in uh, four verticals in some sense. So we look at problems in manufacturing, uh, where we work with uh, companies uh, in order to look at uh, you know, uh, building what are called digital twins. The digital twins are essentially, you can think of them as uh, you know, computer simulations of physical systems uh, that are as, uh, you know, as closely uh, uh, you know, replicating the behavior of the physical system as possible. Right. So quite often people uh, you know, look at the physics behind uh, uh, these uh, systems. Maybe you know, it could be a boiler, it could be some engine. You're looking at the physics behind the systems and then trying to build a simulation of it. But then when you actually start talking about physical equations, you are making approximations. Right. So when you make these approximations and then you build simulations of that, they are going to start deviating from the real system. Right. So what we do typically is you know use uh, uh, machine learning and AI techniques. Right, or data science techniques in order to correct for those deviations. Instead of building the entire model from scratch, we take models that are built with uh, knowledge of the first principles, right, and then correct these models by adding, uh, uh, you know, uh, AI on top of it. Right, and these work much better than trying to build the model completely from scratch. So that's one line of work that we do in manufacturing, and like that, we work with many, many big uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, 
companies uh, uh, in order to uh, solve very hard uh, real problems right and the second vertical we work in is financial analytics and in fact a lot of collaboration happens with uh, uh, the american express lab for data analytics risk and technology which is primarily focused on on the financial domain and understanding you know customer behavior and 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 uh, things like that so we build uh, you know uh, risk models for uh, say the indian population right so in fact i, I, I jokingly say that you know somebody comes and offers as collateral two cows right most of the western models don't know what to do with it right so we have to actually look at it from the indian lens right and then figure out what does it really mean right and so we are building all these kinds of models we work extensively with uh, banks and both indian and foreign uh, bank, bank banking organizations and uh, as well as multiple uh, non profits uh, in order to work in the space right and then the third vertical that we do a lot of work in in fact it's become so vast i should probably start talking about it as two different verticals Uh, it's on systems biology and healthcare, and we work closely with IBSC, which is Center for Integrative Biology and Systems Medicine at uh, IIT Madras, and we look at a lot of uh, what is called omic analysis. In fact, uh, many of the network-related things I was telling you about, right? So, are, uh, are typically uh, uh, done in collaboration with IBSC uh, on for the biological data. So, we can look at gene-gene interaction. We can look at molecular structure. right and and all these kinds of things so that's one part of it the systems biology part of it and we also do a lot of work in the clinical data analysis and trying to build uh, things like uh, you know uh, 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 models for for uh, estimating the age of a fetus right and trying to figure out when when the birth would be premature so that's another uh, interesting problem called garbini that we are working on has had significant impact and, uh, and and across the board right so there are a lot of work that we do in fact you can come to our web page there are a lot of uh, in fact easily accessible blogs written about some of the uh, biosciences work that we do and so that that could that uh, you can read i mean you don't, you don't even have to understand neither neither the biology nor the data science uh, to completely appreciate the impact of the work right and uh, we also do a lot of work in smart cities we collaborate with uh, the center of excellence in urban transportation here in itm and also with a couple of other uh, uh, centers that work in in uh, in the smart city space right so a large fraction of our work is on smart mobility traffic modeling and analysis uh, but we also look at uh, things like pollution and uh, construction management and water distribution power grids uh, managing power grids and looking at connected vehicles and all of these areas also uh, are of interest uh, for uh, rbc city again we work with multiple organizations uh, automotive manufacturing uh, bodies and uh, the smart city corporation of chennai and so on so that's that's basically uh, the work that we do in uh, the application verticals again i urge you to look at the center and uh, there's a lot more uh, space there right and then uh, um, we look at uh, uh, a whole new research focus that has developed uh, over the past year uh, for uh, the the center uh, which is on looking at something called deployable ai right so because we work so extensively in both the fundamental side and as well as uh, working with companies and uh, other uh, you know uh, people who are interested in taking the ai to the ground right so a lot of interesting challenges come up right so so we have a kind of uh, you know uh, focusing on research topics uh, that uh, uh, you know need to be solved before ai can actually go out into the real world and and, and be deployed at various instances so each of these when I mean, some of these are more more general questions and some of these are questions that are uh, very very specific to the domain in which you are deploying the ai right so it could be societal challenges uh, trust uh, 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 you know privacy related challenges and how do i trust the system like the both ethics fairness business and there are some data centric challenges where do i get the data from what do i do if the data quality is not great and so on so forth and then there are organizational challenges right and uh, as well as uh, actual implementation like hardware system level challenges as well right and there are multiple projects that we are uh, that are undergoing uh, at uh, ongoing at rbc desai uh, which are like ai and ethics for the indian context looking at uh, interpretable models for humans in, especially in healthcare right and also looking at incorporating some information that you already know about the system how do i take that into an ai model so there are many many projects that uh, we have been looking at So, like I said, we have extensive network of collaborators, and you see a sampler here, right? And, um, and so this this covers both Indian companies, foreign companies, uh, and uh, government organizations, NGOs, and all that, right? And of course, our collaborations span span the globe. 
And uh, so, like I was mentioning earlier, not only do we do interesting work, but it's also getting recognized now uh, worldwide in terms of best paper uh, awards at various uh, conferences, right? And uh, some of the top conferences as well, some top journals. And we're also having a good social impact. I already mentioned to you about the Garpini project, right? Where, uh, you know, we are using uh, Indian data to build uh, uh, preterm uh, birth. Uh, categorization, right? Uh, but we also work with uh, the the 108 ambulance service, the emergency response service in Chennai, and we work with uh, some organizations like the Dwara Trust on predicting uh, low-income families' financial distress because they don't typically uh, manifest itself in the classical ways. So we have to figure out other surrogate ways in which which you can measure financial distress. And we work on uh, uh, with Arman on uh, you know predicting the, the risk of expectant mothers dropping out of a uh, healthcare program, like education program, right? And likewise, we do a lot of work with other government bodies as well. Right? So again, like, like I said, as many of these uh, social good uh, projects uh, you can read about in our uh, blogs. And our VCD side not only does research but also contributes back in terms of tool sets. I'm sorry, toolkits and data sets to the uh, uh, to the community. And you can look at our GitHub uh, uh, repository to, for accessing some of these uh, uh, things that we are putting out, right? So there are some data sets on traffic, right? Uh, and then the data sets on uh, you know, language, Indian language. And then there is uh, data sets on various genetic uh, uh, phenomena, right? As well as some toolkits on. And all of these, like NV driver and NetGenes, also comes with its own uh, uh, APIs and tools. Right? And also some of some other uh, toolkits that are on their way out. And we also work on trying to build a standardized data repositories in collaboration with uh, Google and as well as with the government uh, in, in, in uh, getting uh, you know, public data accessible to people in a form that is uh, easy to uh, you know, process and do data analytics on, do machine learning on, drive insights on, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, very recently, uh, this National Data Analytics Portal actually ran a competition for some selected college kids. I mean, so we'll get them to you know start inviting the online BSc students uh, uh, once we have more people who have completed the diploma as well uh, uh, to participate in this. Like looking at whatever data sets are available on the Data Analytics Portal and trying to see uh, propose different interesting analysis that can be done. So, so that that should be something for you to watch out for in the coming uh, years. Right. And we work, like I said, we work extensively with industry. So we have an industry consortium where industry partners come and uh, you know, participate in all kinds of activities that happen at RBCT SAT. And we have this very interesting interdisciplinary dual degree program in data science that we run for IATM students. Right? It's a five-year program. So they get a B.Tech in any discipline, but they also get an M.Tech in data science. Right? And uh, so they have a lot of uh, opportunities to interface with the industry during this program. And people come from different branches. So we have people who had a B.Tech in mechanical engineering and an M.Tech in data science and across the board. Right? So there is this interesting program that we run. Uh, so I'm also going to talk about a bunch of uh, resources and other programs that we have that could be of interest to you. So I know many of you have looked at uh, you know on online courses. Uh, apart from this uh, BSc program, we also looked at online courses from NTT. Right? So uh, many of the data science uh, related courses taught by uh, you know, RBC DSI faculty Right. They are available on our web page, but we provide a slightly more uh, detailed interface for them with all kinds of annotations and, uh, and contents and other things that make it easier to navigate the course. Right. So, for example, you can see here a bunch of keywords that have been popped up as content. And you click on any one of these, it will tell you where in the video, in that particular video, is this word being mentioned. Right. And then we are partnering with a company called Video Ken uh, to produce this kind of annotated uh, uh, video. That's something which you can check out if you are looking for some of these courses. Right? And there are many, many, many events, many talks, right? many workshops uh, that happen uh, at RBCT side. Right? And uh, so going forward, uh, we will be you know, announcing uh, whichever workshops we think are you know, appropriate for uh, the students, uh, whichever event is appropriate for students, we will be announcing these and you can uh, join the live stream of those uh, and listen to these talks. Right? I mean, it varies from you know, industry practitioners talking about how AI is used in the industry uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to recent award winners uh, who, who talk about uh, their fundamental work. And, and so on. So then also talking about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, this is, uh, somebody mentioned the best application paper in PAKDD. So we're having a presentation on that and spotlight on the various work that we do. And so summer internship program is uh, open, right? And uh, so uh, 
I think this year might be too early for some of the uh, uh, people who are only doing the online BSc program to apply. But if there are students who are, you know, in their third year in the undergraduate program or or uh, 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 the second year, first year in a, in a postgraduate program, we can happily apply to this uh, summer internship. Just check our website for uh, details of this. But but I think it's closing very soon, so you should apply quickly, right? And uh, so then we have an innovative thing called the post baccalaureate fellowship. This is typically for people who have finished their undergrad or finished their masters, right? Uh, and uh, so they can explore, uh, all, they can be part of RBC DSI uh, and they, they undertake independent research projects. It's not like they have to work on something that the faculty tells them. Right? And they had some very interesting uh, uh, alumna, alumni from this program and almost all of them have gone on to uh, careers in data science. Either they've gone on to grad school and doing a PhD in uh, AI and data science or, uh, or, also, or have gone on to a career in data science. Right? So again, um, this program is open now, and there are two versions of it. I mean, you can apply for the regular uh, post baccalaureate fellowship, right? Uh, but we also have uh, a post baccalaureate fellowship uh, for women. So uh, applications are open now, and if uh, people are eligible for it, do apply. So don't don't apply if you are in the second year or third year for this program because it's a full time job, right? And so that's that's another opportunity for people to work with us, and of course. Obviously, we have post baccalaureate fellowship. We need to have post doctoral fellowships, and that we do. And uh, please check our website. I, I, I don't think uh, there will be a great uh, audience here for this, but uh, just just to mention that it's there. Right? And then there's something that's interesting that we are doing along with uh, the online BSc program. Uh, so where we are actually started giving our teaching fellowships for people to join uh, uh, RBC DSI, do research at RBC DSI at the same time also help with uh, you know, uh, teaching, become a mentor or an instructor for the online BSc program. So uh, if there are people here who would qualify to this, it, either it can be as a post baccalaureate level or it could be at a postdoctoral level. Again, uh, details are all up on our webpage. I encourage you to uh, look at it, right? And uh, so thank you. If you, like, like I said, right? So we are on social media, we are on the web. And so feel free to check us out. I'm free to take questions. Thank you so much sir, for such a great event. It was very insightful and detailed of everything. And it also gives us a new platform for new opportunities. Uh, so if anyone has any question, they can post in the chat box. Post in the chat box. Oh, man. OK. Oh, uh, so there is someone who wants to ask that how can they start their career as a fresher in data science? Uh, how can they start their career as a fresher in data science? See, first of all, uh, I, I'm, it's not entirely clear to me at what level you're asking about. I mean, are you asking how do I get started you know, learning data science or how do I, I mean, I have learned data science, I have done my online BSc program, what do I do next? It's not clear to me. So if you are asking about, hey, I've done my online uh, uh, BSc program, and uh, now what is next? Well, it depends on what you want to do. And the way we have designed the program, right, it's uh, tailored to make you a fully uh, credentialed data science professional at the end of the three years, right? So you should uh, have no difficulty, uh, you know, getting getting into a data science job, and that is the way that you want to pursue, right? And uh, the, the program also you know, gives you the, the right fundamentals if you are inclined to you know, go for higher studies in data science as well. And, and, and uh, uh, so look, if you're interested in looking for a master's again, uh, the program does give you uh, uh, the tools that are needed, right? So that way, if you have completed the program, I mean, it's up to you. You can choose the pathway you want to go. Go, go, as a, go. go to the industry as a practitioner and then come back and study a little bit more and improve your qualifications. Or just go ahead and go for a uh, higher studies program. On the other hand, if you're asking me, how do I get started in terms of you know, studying to be a uh, you know, data scientist, right? Uh, hey, come on. What kind of skills are expected while applying to the post back program? Is it the same person who was asking me about this? Uh, it is from YouTube. Oh, it's from YouTube. Okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, so if you are starting out and you want to know what to do to get into data science, right? Uh, one thing is, of course, enroll in the online BSc program. So, suppose you don't want to commit to that. 
um, uh, then there are a lot of uh, material out there, right? So if you already have some good exposure to programming and good exposure to, uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the problem settings that people talk about, right? There are ways in which you can start off by looking at these online course material, whether it's Mentitel or whether it's some other, uh, uh, other sources, there are enough material out there for you to start learning. Right. If you want to become a good data scientist, there are a set of courses uh, that I would uh, recommend that you should do. In fact, uh, like earlier, I used to have to do this uh, uh, to people. Right, I had to give a list of courses that they have to take. Right. Now you can just go and look at the the courses that you need to complete to earn a diploma in data science in the online BSc program. One of the two diplomas. Right. You have one in programming, one in data science. Right. Look at this list of courses that you have to do to get uh, uh, online uh, get a diploma in data science, and that. I mean, regardless of whether you do it through the online BSc program or whether you go out and find other material to do it from, those are the, the minimal set of courses that you need to do to become a good data scientist, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's my answer to that question. Uh, so someone is asking, is there any age limit to the internships and all? And so the is, there any what? is there any age limit to the opportunities of uh, all these opportunities which you mentioned earlier? Uh, age limit to these opportunities. Uh, of course, yes. Uh, the uh, I mean, upper age, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Upper age. I have to check with that right? because many of many 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 of the students are just out of school. So you're asking about an upper age or lower age. There is an upper age limit, uh, especially for the post baccalaureate program. I think uh, the upper uh, limit is uh, 27 years. As of this June or something, as of the coming June, you shouldn't be more than 27. And it's, I think, uh, 28 or 29 if you're uh, applying for the women uh, program. And uh, for uh, all of the programs, they're open to both uh, you know, men and women, except the women post back program. Uh, the only difference between the regular post back program and the women post back program is actually... Because women are, you know, typically are fighting a lonely battle in technology, right? So what we do with the women post postback program is that we, we arrange for mentors, both from the industry and from uh, academia, women mentors, uh, to come and meet with these uh, 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 the postback fellows and have uh, conversations with them and also you know, answer their questions about surviving as a woman in the technology field and things like that. So that's this kind of a little bit of an additional uh, assistance, right? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, being a woman and, and and making it in the technology field, right? So that is one of the reasons we have a special fellowship for women, nothing else. Otherwise, everything else, the, as far as the benefits, the qualification norms we apply, and all of these are, are same, right? Uh, and uh, so the age limit is, is there. If you, if you ask about uh, engineering versus non-engineering, as I saw one query about somebody who is who's doing a BSc honors in mathematics, right? And it's fine, you can apply. Right, so you can apply uh, uh, even with the math background. The only challenge is that for the internships and for the uh, uh, the fellowships, right, we do give you a coding challenge. You have to get through the programming challenge uh, uh, before you can uh, uh, before we will interview. You. Right, so if your if your programming skills are very poor, then you won't be able to make it through the uh, uh, coding challenge. So even if you have a math background, uh, getting through that is important. So it's not it's not like it's not like super fancy computer programming or anything, but you should know uh, uh, how to get through that, right? So for three-year degrees, is a little bit of a challenge. Um, for the online BSc students, right? So we are going to open up the internships for anybody who has completed the two first two diplomas, right? So so that, that would mean typically mean you would have done two years in the program, right? So for, but uh, since it's our own program and we know what we are teaching, so we are opening that up, right? Uh, if it's a two-year degree elsewhere, uh, uh, we'll have to take a call, right? So you could write to us. Uh, we might ask you details about your, for example, CMI's three-year degree, we're happy, right? We're happy to take people for internships from there. If it's a three-year degree from elsewhere, uh, you'll have to uh, uh, apply, write to us and check with us, right? So I, mean, I wouldn't uh, close it down, but I also won't throw it open. So we have to check with us. Yes. yes. And you have to tell me, I mean, the questions have just been scrolling up too fast. I can't keep up with it. So, so <laughs> read a few interesting questions to me. Okay. Someone is asking what kind of skill sets they can expect when applying for post-bac program. Post-baccalaureate program? Post-bac program. Post-bac. Uh, what kind of skill sets do you expect? Uh, what 
do you mean by that so okay so we are we ask people to okay i'll tell you what the selection process is and then you take your call right so the first thing is uh, we expect you to write a, a meaningful uh, a statement of purpose right so you need to write something that's just like you are applying for uh, you know a, a, a graduate school abroad right so you write statement of purpose which kind of outlines why is it that you want to do this program why is it you want to do research and you know if there are any particular faculty or a particular project in the center that interests you or if you have done any interesting projects in the past right so we take the statement of purpose very seriously in fact we have relaxed uh, people who have written stellar uh, statement of purpose we have relaxed even the marks requirements for them to get it right so that's one thing uh, the second thing is uh, we look at uh, the coding challenge right so you have to go through a programming uh, round and if you do well in the programming round only then you progress to the next round so after the programming round is done uh, the next round is a technical interview so we 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 ask you questions on the fundamentals of machine learning like things like you know can you under, what do you understand regression and, and very simple simple questions right so, so nothing that a person who has uh, gone through the online basic program or ace right so it's, it's easy enough but these are like basic fundamental questions in machine learning so and only then after that you actually have an interview with the faculty member right so this is so the interns don't uh, interns basically do the programming challenge and and have a very minimal uh, uh, you know technical uh, interview and then we select the interns uh, but uh, with the post baccalaureate fellows we have the, the statement of purpose is the first screening and the next the programming and next you have the technical interview and then you have a interview with uh, with a set of faculty members and you choose which faculty member you want to apply to right who who would, who you would like to be a mentor for you in the post baccalaureate program and then you, you basically get uh, interviewed by the set of faculty I mean you can choose one two three how many you want and then you get interviewed by them and periodically we put out you know special uh, calls right for example we had a large uh, covid data analytics project where we put out a call for uh, uh, post baccalaureate fellows in the covid to join the covid project right so that uh, 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 in, in such a case then you you might get interviewed by another panel uh, that's working on the covid project right so but if you're looking you're asking skill sets programming and fundamentals of machine learning uh, are, are two things important things okay that's good okay as there is a uh, upper age limit in the applying so what can for the upper age limit is for the the post baccalaureate fellowships and the internships right okay so, yeah. so as a post doc post doc post doc the upper age limit is fairly uh, wide i think yeah maybe mm -hmm. up to 30 or something yeah <laughs> some people are asking that uh, there are people who say that there are no jobs uh, for fresher in data science can you uh, say something about that oh man uh, <laughs> uh, that is that is a hard question to answer and uh, i'm not sure see um there are uh, too many uh programs out there right that claim that they are producing data scientists in fact they don't uh, you know they don't give a good background in math I mean, they basically teach you like one or two tools how to use those tools to you know solve regression problems and they say oh we teach you how to uh, you know identify people from photographs or something like that and there's like just like one one simple uh, setting of a tool and then you give it a data set you run it and the output output comes something and so Uh, that's not really training you to be a data scientist right it just basically gives you some kind of uh, uh, you know minimal hacking skills in, in putting together a, a, a data science uh, solution right it doesn't really make you a data scientist right and uh, so you what you really need is is a program like uh, um, this online bsc program or or a more rigorous training like we provide with our uh, data science uh, masters right where you get a good grounding in the fundamentals of math and you are able to understand and uh, you know uh, you know interpret domain specific problems right uh, in the context of uh, data science right so what is a data science issue here and so on and so forth so once you get this kind of a rounded data science profile that or the those are the kind of people the industry is looking for right industry is you now has its fill of this you know data hackers right i mean the people who can just run a little bit on um 
uh, you know know how to do three tools right and then if you tell them what is a machine learning problem you want to solve they can solve classification they can solve regression and basically that's it and those kinds of skill sets right uh, i think i think that, that those are saturating the industry and people are not really interested so if you want to be a data scientist and look for jobs make sure that you are a rounded data scientist so if you are going out of this online bc program i think you have not much to worry about Uh, but yeah, the, the the industry landscape is is a fast evolving one. But uh, I think if you have the right fundamentals, you should be fine. Thank you, sir. That will help us to increase career, increase our career. Our next question is: After learning about the algorithms of machine learning, what kind of product uh, projects or research topics should we try to address as a beginner? Oh man. so there are many interesting problems that are out there but but if you want to do research right uh, just after you understand the fundamentals of uh, you know data science by maybe doing the first year course or something like it's, it's it's challenging for you to do it independently you really need to have some kind of a mentor right and uh, so i would strongly recommend uh, after you finish uh, both your uh, programming and your uh, data science diplomas to strongly look for internships whether it is at iit madras itself or internships elsewhere right so we are talking to a lot of other partner institutes who are happy to open up uh, internships for our then bc students right so we'll hopefully there'll be a lot more opportunities so i would strongly recommend uh, doing uh, this kind of a research internship right that will give you uh, the uh, the exposure you need and if you try to independently get into research after just uh, you know running the fundamentals of uh, ml or fundamentals of data science it's going to be a hard uh, hard slog Mm. I mean, there is no one size fits all answer to these kinds of questions so if you don't if, you, if i give you this kind of generalist answers don't don't be disappointed but that's the truth you have to look for an internship yeah. yes uh, so some people are asking that uh, there is an option of uh, give rank them, but they don't have any rank so can they apply Sorry, for is there an option of of giving your rank in the form of internship summer internship ah no if you don't have a rank it's fine if you have a rank it's optional you don't have to fill it in mm. uh the internships at rbc i just one question just popped up how long are the internships at rbc side rbc side they vary right uh, we have internships that run for 8 uh, weeks and we have things that run for 6 months also i mean you have to look at so for our internships are not just you apply for an internship there are projects that are listed on the web page you apply to a specific project and each project will have varying durations of uh, internship so you can apply to this based on that but but you have to i mean if you are only in the online bsc program you need to have two diplomas before you can apply right and if you are you're also doing an additional program elsewhere uh, you can apply if you finish three years okay some some people are asking that uh, in screening round in programming exam there is a- is it related to machine learning or problem solving like which is it the programming exam it's it's machine learning okay it's it's, um, it's a very 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 fundamental ml thing you can you can easily crack it i mean you don't have to be an expert in ml to solve that so i'd like to answer this one question i am a chartered accountant with 20 20 plus years experience in software solutions so basically the question is are there options for post graduates in uh, data science and rbct side right so the post baccalaureate fellowships ironically even though it's named post baccalaureate fellowships is also open for people with a masters degree right uh, but uh, um but there there is an age limit to it right if you have 20 plus experience is going to be a little challenging why don't you write to me uh, kv and then we can figure out how right uh, uh, the internship is currently planned to be offline Uh, but we are happy to consider online mode as well i mean if if there are something that prevents you from traveling offline but the only condition is that you should commit time to the internship you can't be doing something else and then say that i'll do the internship offline uh and uh, yeah so the you know i mean we do have some kind of a minimum bar on gpa i will not tell you what it is but if you write a good sop a good sop then uh, we are we, we, we will wait that so, so think about that right Uh, we don't don't 
no yeah letters of recommendations are not uh, mandatory somebody is asking do i need a letter of recommendation uh, letters of recommendation are not mandatory for the post bac programs right? only for the post doctoral fellowship letters of recommendation is mandatory for the other programs we don't need it uh, yeah so applying for an ms at iit madras after 3 years mm, right now no uh, but that might change down the line i don't know but right now regulations say you need to have at least a four year degree uh, before applying for ms or you should have done a bsc msc somewhere and then you can apply for an ms in an engineering discipline right? the questions are not interesting that i got so many questions So the rank in your college and letter of recommendation should be optional. So somebody can very quickly try it out on the web page and tell me if it is come mandatory. Then I'll change the form. Hmm. Okay. Somebody is asking me uh, the lack of coding and software tooling is the biggest stumbling block in AI in India. Will you agree? Yeah. A lack of AI skills also, uh, but all of it all together. Uh, system development skills are poor in India. That's one of the biggest challenges. We are hoping to address this through this program. So somebody is asking: Is this open source contribution mandatory in this? Uh, nothing is mandatory. It is mandatory. What is mandatory? Oh, LOR is mandatory. For what program are you applying? Which so, is asking open source contribution mandatory? It's just asking it's that. Not, it's not. It's not. open source contribution is not mandatory and so rank is mandatory there in the form rank is mandatory in the internship form okay i'll ask them to change it but if you are only doing the online bsc program you cannot apply for the internship until you finish both your uh, first two diplomas right uh, both the programming and the data science diploma so it's currently i don't think anyone has finished both uh, and so you can't apply i think so that's why <laughs> ha ah, okay so rank is mandatory i'll i'll sorry about that uh, but tomorrow try again uh, over the weekend we'll remove the rank uh, and um, that's all sir thank you so I much for my email address i just put that in the chat window here Okay, for people on YouTube, it's Ravi at CSC dot IATM dot AC dot A. I mean, you can find me by googling me. Yeah. Uh, uh, somebody is asking, can I apply for multiple internships? You can't do that concurrently. But if you're applying one after the other, sure. Okay, fine. I think we should stop. And a uh, lot of interesting questions. And uh, is, is there any way that you can collect all these questions uh, to and then uh, and, and then I can try and answer them offline? And if there is a way, you can share it to the on uh, the students. And then that way. Yes, sir. we will try. So thank you, guys. And I'm happy to see so many people actively asking questions and participating. Thank you so much, sir. It has been such a great event from your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye, sir.